There's some wonderful truths that we want to notice as we consider on about the life of the Lord Jesus. And here I want to see that the Lord Jesus is in the perfect will of God. He never was outside the will of God because he said, Father, I have come to do your will. And the Lord Jesus exercised his own will in obeying the Father's will. And uh, as we have been looking at his life and studying his teachings, and we see here after he was filled and baptized by the Holy Spirit, that the first place the Spirit uh, takes him and leads him is into the wilderness. It's actually interesting the word here that Mark uses, and this is why I've read part of this verse, and immediately the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness. The Spirit driveth him into the wilderness. And what that word driveth is really meaning is to be impelled. In other words, he, he was just so impelled and under the influence of the Holy Spirit that he could go no other way. And the Spirit of God impelled him. He, he was leading him. He was impressing upon him that this is the way forward. And uh, I have experienced that in my own life, as I'm sure you have as a Christian, when you've been praying and seeking God and asking the Lord that the Spirit comes with such an urgency and such an impelling upon your life that He urges you and impels you into a certain direction, the direction, of course, that He wants you to go. And uh, it's wonderful as we look at the life of Christ, because as we have brought out on other Sunday mornings, that he says that we have to walk in his steps as he walked, and that the servant is not greater than the master. And so we want to look here at the place of the temptations, the place of the temptations. And the Lord Jesus has been impelled and led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness, the wilderness, the wilderness, in fact, of Judea. And he's there to be tested and tried of the enemy of the devil. And he's, it says there on verse 2 of Matthew chapter 4, and when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward unhungered. And we know from Scripture that 40 is the number of testing. 40 in Scripture is the number of testing. Noah was in the ark uh, the rains came for 40 days and 40 nights and battered upon that ark, and the whole world was destroyed by the flood. We know that the children of Israel spent 40 years in the, the wilderness wanderings because of their disobedience and wouldn't enter in by faith to the promised land, and that whole generation died as a result of disobedience. Do you see the result of disobedience in the life of the believer? You can miss God's will for your life. He wants to take you into Canaan to bless you with the fruit of milk and honey and the blessings and the power of God, but as a result of stubbornness and hardness and censoriousness and unbelief, the believer lives in Moab, and he lives in the wilderness instead of enjoying the blessings of all the fullness that God has for them. And it's sad to say in my Christian experience in over almost 30 years, that so many believers are living in the wilderness of life and not in the land of Canaan that God has for them. And that's a tragedy, but yet that's a re so much a reality in the life of many Christians. And I, as a young man, I want to live in Canaan land. And Canaan is a place of warfare and it's a place where the, the land, the Lord said to the children of Israel, I have given you this land, now go and possess it. And they had to fight for the victories, which is a picture of going through and going on with God and possessing the promises and blessings that God has for us. And that's the life I want. I want my inheritance. Like Caleb said, give me this mountain Sure, you're 80 years of age. What are you looking at my mountain? He says, it's mine, and I want it, and he got it. So no matter, what, no matter what age you are, you can receive God's inheritance and God's blessing in your life. And so this wilderness 
is where the Lord Jesus was driven. It's a place of testing. The first temptation of, human, of the human race, of course, was in the Garden of Eden, where Adam and Eve were placed in that garden, which is a picture of God's delight. You know, if any of you like gardens, I love gardens, I love gardening. You just see God's handiwork and everything. You see His beauty, His creation. A garden speaks of the fullness of the blessing of God in your life. When He would place you into such a place, He couldn't give you anything more and He couldn't give you anything better. Gardens speak of tranquility and flourishing and peace and joy and happiness and contentment and fragrance. All the blessings of God to place you in the garden that He prepared for His children. That's a picture of heaven. Oh, the blessings that lie for us as God's children in that wonderful place that God is preparing for us. And so, dear friends, the Lord uh, placed Adam and Eve, and we know that the first test was in a garden. In Genesis 3, 1 and 8, we read that, the record of Adam and Eve's sin and the fall. And there we know that Satan won, and Adam lost, not God. That's very important to recognize that. God didn't lose in the Garden of Eden. It was man that lost. God has never lost a battle. He has never lost a victory. He has never lost, never, ever, and never will, and never can, because He's Almighty God. The fall, the origin of sin would come into the world. Man lost. Man lost out, not God. God had a plan, and still has a plan, and will fulfill His plans. And here we're seeing the Lord Jesus coming in answer to that plan, that promise that He gave to to Adam and Eve that day. He said, the seed will come. And here He is. God keeps His Word. God keeps His promises. And so the seed has come, the Lord Jesus And the amazing thing about the battle, Adam's battle was the natural battle. It was the natural battling the spiritual. I don't know why you ever thought about that, because we can put so much emphasis on that, oh, look what Adam caused. But he was outnumbered. By a greater capacity, he was the lower creation. Man, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Thou hast made him, listen, a little lower than the angels. The angels are a higher creation next to God. And then there's the eternal, the eternal God himself, who, was never, who wasn't created because he's God, he's eternal. That's what the difference between angels are everlasting, because they had a beginning. God is eternal because he had no beginning. And we are made a little lower than the angels by procreation, by creation. And so this battle was an unfair battle, really, in the sense that it was Adam who was a natural man battling a spiritual foe. And remember, Adam was made in innocence, and God placed him in that garden And there Satan came, the spiritual superior being, and he usurped his authority and took control of the human earth as a result of sin. And Adam lost the title deeds to the earth. That's what happened. And Satan gained that through subtlety, through craftiness, and he purchased, or he he claimed that earth, and he brought sin and death into the world. But you see, the Lord Jesus has come, And Christ's battle is the spiritual now engaging the spiritual. They're on equal planes now in that sense. It's a spiritual battle that's taking place here. And what is happening in the wilderness is a picture of spiritual warfare of the believer. And as we look at these temptations, which we're going to do over these next Sunday mornings, as we look at the temptations of Christ, we'll see this. We'll see all this happening. And so, the wilderness is a picture of Satan's domain. Why ever really thought about that? Because it's a picture of a cursed and a barren land. If you look into your wilderness, it's not appealing at all. You would have no desire to go into that place, into a wilderness place, a barren land. 
And yet the Father is sending the Son into Satan's territory now. He's sending him into his own ground to meet him face to face. Friends, it's, it's marvelous, wonderful what the Lord has done for us and what He accomplished. Now, very quickly, I want to maybe bring this out before you've maybe really never thought about this before. Why was Jesus tempted to sin uh, of the devil? Why was Jesus tempted to sin of the devil? Well, we know that uh, Jesus is God, manifest in the flesh, It's impossible for God to lie, and it's impossible for God to sin. Jesus cannot sin. It's impossible for Jesus to sin because He's God. But that doesn't bypass the fact that He's tempted. And so, the Lord Jesus is driven and led into into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil, but we know that Jesus cannot sin. So, why, why would this happen? Well, first of all, to prove that Jesus is sinless. To prove that the Lord Jesus is sinless. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, that Scripture speaks about that He being made sin for us who knew no sin, that we could become the righteousness of of God in him. And so, he was driven into the wilderness, led into the wilderness to prove Jesus to be sinless. And he is the sinless Son of the eternal God. Not only only to prove Jesus to be sinless, but also to establish the fact that he is the Son of God. He is who He says He is. He is the Son of God. Many people seem to grasp or find that difficult to understand, but the Lord Jesus is the Son of God. And also, it's, He's coming to be tempted as man in all points like as we are. Remember, we have brought out in these studies that the Lord Jesus had the two natures, the nature of man, not the carnal, sinful nature, the human nature. He's fully man, and He's fully God. He's of the womb of Mary, but the impregnation came via the Holy Spirit. And the day that the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Word, left heaven's glory— when Mary accepted the call of the angel, she said, Let it be to thy handmaid according to thy will. And at that moment, the Holy Spirit impregnated Mary, and the eternal word became the Son. At that moment, he was begotten. That's fulfilling the scriptures where the Lord Jesus said in Psalm 2, This day have I begotten thee. At that moment, the Word became flesh, became a Son. The eternal God became the Son of Man. Can you grasp that? That's what happened. And so here, he's being driven into the wilderness to be tested in his humanity. In his humanity. And why would the Lord Jesus let that? Why would God the Father let that happen? Well, to prove that Jesus is sonless and that he is, of course, who he said he is, the Son of God, to be tempted as man. And Hebrews 4.15 says that the Lord Jesus, he was tempted in all points as like we are yet without sin. We read that in Hebrews 4 verse 15. The Lord Jesus was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. So, whatever temptation you're going through this morning as man, the Lord Jesus understands because He was man, because He was fully man. He knew what it was as we study His life and look at His life. He knows what it is to be hungry. He knows what it is to be lonely. 
He knows what it is to cry. He knows what it is to feel pain. He knows all those feelings of emptiness and abandonment and loneliness and hurt and pain and emotional trauma. He's been through it all. He knows all about that. And this is why he's our sympathetic high priest. He's able to identify with your problems this morning, with your sufferings, because he endured the same himself. He became like us, to identify with us. And this is why he's the compassionate Christ. He understands you this morning. And so he's going into this wilderness period also to strengthen and to empower him for his mighty ministry. Do you remember we spoke about last week about the, about the butterfly in the cocoon and how in that period that metamorphosis was taking place, how God was doing something in the unseen from the human eye and changing the caterpillar into the moth. And the old creation is being transformed into the new creation in there. And out come this beautiful butterfly that God had planned to fly. The various stages in the Christian life and God is, is, has the Lord Jesus into this place of trial and temptation. And what he's doing in here, as we go through these temptations and come out the other end, you'll see something of the mighty mystery and the power of God in the work in a human life. Away in the unseen regions where God works in your soul and where God works in your spirit, and when God works in the deep crevices of your heart where only the Spirit of the Lord can really attend to and minister to. It's marvelous, the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the life of a man or woman. Oh, the deep things of God. And so he's taken the Lord Jesus into this place to strengthen him, to empower him for his mighty ministry, and of course, for an example for us to follow. And that's the glorious truth of the Lord Jesus. He's our example we are to follow him. As I've said previously, we cannot live a sinless -like life like Christ. That is impossible. We are not preaching sinless perfection. It's impossible. We can't live a sinless life, but we can live a victorious life. And to live a victorious life in Christ and to live for Christ is this. When you're living a victorious life, your conscience is clear. Your conscience is clear before God and before men. The Bible says, if our conscience condemn us not. In other words, if I was living a life as a believer, if there's sin in my life, if there's problems in my life, the Holy Spirit will convict me in my conscience. Your conscience is where God speaks to you. That's the light of life that's in every man, is the conscience. That's what God, the light that God has placed in everyone. And this is why the whole world is without excuse this morning. Uh, we could get in now to the book of Romans. You're without excuse. Your conscience bearing your witness. And we have the light, the right and the wrong. We know what's right. And as a believer, I can't live a sinless life. I can live a victorious life. And as I seek to walk with God, if there's areas in my life where things are not right, well, then I can go and deal with that and repent of that and get that relationship back on track. I'm not living a sinless life, but I'm seeking to live a victorious life in the power of the Holy Spirit as the Lord Jesus has asked me and commanded me to do, to walk with him as he walked with his Father. And I'm trying to encourage you to do the same this morning, to walk with God, to walk in the light as He is in the light. And if you're walking in light, He'll reveal areas in your life that are not right. Just put them right. Don't complicate it. Just obey the Word, and your conscience will be clear and clean, and you'll be walking in fellowship with God You'll see answers to your prayers. You'll know the presence and power of God in your life. You'll have victory over sin. You'll have the presence of God continually. And you'll have your enemies to face with God with you. And so he's our example. So we had there, we looked at the place of the temptations, the wilderness. I'll tell you, it's not a very appealing place to be as a believer <clears throat> when you're brought into this wilderness. Into this wilderness. But there's the purpose of the temptations. 
What is the purpose of these temptations? Well, the Lord Jesus, he's coming to destroy the works of the devil. But I want to speak, I missed this point out here, the timing of the temptations. This is so important. The timing of the temptations. Why now? The Lord Jesus, in Luke 3.21, he's been baptized with the Holy Spirit. He's been filled of God's Spirit. Remember we spoke about Philippians 2.5, the, the great, the kenos, the Greek kenos means self-emptying. He emptied himself. And this is why uh, the Lord Jesus had to be filled with the Holy Spirit. This is the, the, the humility of God coming down in such a fashion to redeem men and women. And uh, he's been now filled with the Holy Spirit. He's been anointed with the Spirit for his ministry. He's been baptized by the power of God. And God's first calling after the filling of the Holy Spirit was to send him into the barren wilderness of trials and temptations. This is the first place he sent him into the wilderness. He was impaled by the Spirit into the wilderness. Dear friends, it's amazing the priorities that God puts upon His children and where He places them and what, what He puts them into. And so, we didn't call Him to preach first. He sent Him in to be tested of the devil. You know, whenever you're going on with God and you want to go through with God, your consecration will be tested. You'll be tested of God in certain areas of your life. And God will do that, and we are no different to Christ. And He'll do that. He'll test us. He'll test our consecration. And so, the purpose of the temptation was to destroy the works of the devil, to destroy the works of the devil. Let me read these couple of verses to you from Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood— He also himself likewise took part of the same. What does that mean? He took a human body. That through death he might destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. The devil had the power of death as a result of sin that Adam forfeited in the Garden of Eden. So the Lord Jesus is coming to destroy him that had the power of death. The devil and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels. He didn't come as an angel. This is the amazing thing about the Lord. If God would have, the Lord Jesus would have came of an angel, and he would have said to me, follow me. I would have said, Lord Jesus, I can't because I'm not an angel. Angels can disappear. Angels can reappear. Angels can take on human form. Angels can can walk on water. Angels can fly over water. Angels can do wonderful things. And I could have said, Lord Jesus, I really admire you. You're such a wonderful angel, but I certainly couldn't follow you. But the Lord Jesus, he wasn't made in the image or form of an angel. He was made in human form so that he's able to say, live as I lived, walk as I walked, follow me. Fully man and fully God. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham, the promised seed, the seed of Abraham, the body, the human body. Wherefore in all things it behoved him to be made like unto his brethren, to be made like unto his brethren. He was made fully man, like his brethren. That he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in all things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. There's his purpose, to deal with the sin question. For in that he himself, listen, has suffered being tempted. I'll tell you there's suffering being tempted and tried and tested of the devil. But he is able to succor them that are tempted. Why is he able? Because he's been there himself. He's been there himself. And so he's able to 
uh, be tempted as a man in all parts like we are in identification with us, and we can follow him. And so, dear friends, the purpose of the temptations are to destroy the works of the devil. And there's a twofold purpose, really. Satan's purpose in these temptations is to get us to engage in sin. For that's what temptation is. Satan's goal in temptation for the believer is to get you to engage in sin. That's what he's about. It's an invitation to sin. On sin, he will make it so attractive and so appealing that you'll need to use the power of the Holy Ghost to resist it. Sin is attractive. This is why advertisers spend millions and millions on advertising and promoting their products. Think of the money spent on alcohol. And they'll show you all the glamorous ladies in bikinis and many of these advertisements on billboards and so on. What a wonderful life. But I watched there recently the rise and fall of George Best and was seen in the last photograph of him alive in the paper. That's the result of sin and death. If you listen to George Best's testimony, he just loved the alcohol. Oh, the devil will take you further than you want to go. And this is what Satan was about in, in to temptation to get you to engage in sin, and it's subtle. Sin starts off like cobwebs. You ever watch a little spider? My wife hates them. She'll run from them. Nikita, she leaves the house for them. And he weaves his little web. And he's working away. And he's as happy as things can be. And he's weaving his little web. And the blue bottle, it's just flying around. And it's just so unconcerned till he gets it finished. And then he gets into the corner and he just waits. And when he's least expecting it, Big Daddy Blue Bottle flies into the, into the web and he's caught. And he struggles to break free. And because as the result of the strength of sin, the strength of the cobweb to hold him, he can't break free. And the spider comes and devours him. Oh, there's pleasure in sin for a season. But ultimately, unless something stronger than the spider comes to the rescue of the fly, it's finished. But thank God, our blessed Lord Jesus come down from heaven and entered into the wilderness of temptations, into the devil's web, and destroyed him that had the power of sin and death. Our blessed Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, he returned victorious over Satan and over sin and over every strand of web that he webbed to seek to engage the Lord Jesus to sin. Do you realize the mighty Savior we have this morning in setting us free from the strands of sin? And as a Christian, I want to tell you this morning, if you don't deal with your issues, he's webbing He's putting a string, a cobweb. He's putting a silk thread around your life. 
And if you don't deal with that sin and put that thing right, then you're giving the spider of Satan an opportunity to put another cobweb around you. And they start off as little cobwebs. And as a Christian, if you don't deal with the areas in your life that God is showing you, these cobwebs become iron clumps. And you'll live as your life as a Christian in the web of Satan's snare, vibrating, never fulfilling the will of God in your life. What a tragedy. That's Satan's purpose. But God's purpose in this is to reveal his power in us as we refuse to sin. That's the difference. As we refuse to sin. You have a choice in temptation. You can either yield or refuse to yield. And God gives you the power to refuse. When when Satan brings a temptation, he'll bring it to your mind. And instantaneously, what happens in the mind is the conscience speaks. That's wrong. And immediately you apply your spirit to your conscience and say, no, the Holy Ghost comes and helps you to resist the temptation. But if the temptation comes and the conscience speaks to you, no, and you continue on to do what you're doing, the Holy Spirit won't help you. Let me give you an illustration. If you're watching television, for instance, on something obscene or something filthy or something, whatever it is, is on that television screen, and immediately as a Christian, your conscience will speak to you, get that off. Immediately you hit the button, you turn it off, the Holy Spirit is there to help you to say no to the sin. But if you sit a little longer and, the, and your, your conscience is saying, turn that off, and you continue to appear at that, the Holy Spirit will not come to your aid because your free will is you want it, you're lusting. And that's what happens. You lust to the sin. You give yourself over to the sin, and then the sin becomes, you've consented. And so this is why Paul writes, abstain from all appearance of evil. You see, your conscience is, is God's spy in your life, and he's, it's his light inside of you to show you this. And so as we resist temptation and as we resist sin, then the Lord is able to strengthen us in the temptation But even if we do sin and we do engage it, we can repent of that sin. We can ask the Lord to forgive us. He cleanses us immediately and we're instantaneously restored into fellowship and our conscience is clear. And the next time the thing comes on in television, well, don't make the same mistake again. This is how we learn and grow up in Christ. But I want to say quickly that the seat of the temptations is the battlefield of the mind. This is what Satan attacks you. He attacks you in your mind. Your mind. The battlefield is the mind. The battle is won or lost up here. Look. In here. The battlefield of the mind. And the Lord Jesus, as we look at him, the enemy hits the mind, the will, and the body. Those are the three main areas of spiritual attack. This is where he comes to the believer. He'll hit your mind, your will, which makes your choices, and your body. And he'll hit those areas. Those are the three main areas of Christ's temptations, and we'll look at these in the coming weeks, the temptations of the devil. Remember reading on one occasion, sow a thought, reap a desire. Sow a desire, reap an action. Sow an action, reap a habit, sow a habit, reap a character, sow a character, reap a destiny. To use the illustration again, and I don't know whether George Best was saved or not, a trust and pray was, but that's a typical example, and there's multitudes like that. Multitudes like that. Sow a habit, 
reap a destiny. Okay? It's there. And so, dear friend, but I don't want you to think, you know, about all desires are bad, for they're not. Desires that can be either good or bad or neither. You can have a good desire, desire to come to the prayer meeting, a desire to help someone, good desires, and then bad desires, things that come into your mind and these satanic darts that the devil throws in that you just say, where did that come from? Those are evil desires, bad desires, and you don't want to do that. And then there's desires that are neutral, they're neither good or bad. But we see here the powers behind the temptations, very quickly. The powers behind the temptations. I wouldn't want you to think for one minute that uh, God is tempting you to sin, or God was tempting the Lord Jesus by placing him in this position that he was putting him in a place of vulnerability uh, to sin. James 1.13, God does not tempt us to sin. He doesn't. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. That means tempted to sin in its context. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man to sin. God does not tempt us to sin. And here's something you can learn very simply this morning. If you're being tempted to do something that's wrong, the devil's behind it, not God. If he's tempting you to do something that's wrong, something that's unscriptural and unbiblical, you know without a shadow of a doubt that's not from God. It's not from the Holy Spirit. It's from the devil to seek to get you to engage in sin. But God does permit us to be tempted, and we know that from the life of Christ. He permits us to be tempted. And when the Lord Jesus was being tempted there in the wilderness, uh, Jesus was engaging Satan face to face. He was taking him on face to face. And it's very interesting, whenever this temptation of the Lord Jesus has taken place in obscurity, uh, from the unseen uh, eyes of others, that John the Baptist was preaching away the baptism of repentance. But the devil was here with the Savior. He knew who to target. He knew where the power lay. He knew, he knew who to come to. And he knows to train his guns on. Do you know that there's many Christians who blame the devil and the devil has nothing to do with them? Do you know why? Because they're not a threat. They're not doing anything to threaten him. Their prayers aren't being answered. They're not living a life for God. And as a result of that, Satan just lets them live on. As someone, an old man, said to me on one occasion, you know, Satan doesn't shoot dead ducks. He's only half trains his guns on the living ones. And John the Baptist preaching away, Satan here, he knows who's the threat to his kingdom. And if you're, as a believer, experiencing trials, troubles, tribulations, listen, take encouragement. Take encouragement from that, that God is using your life and that God is working through you to fulfill his will and plan for your life. And Mark says in, his, in, in, in this passage, and there, there was the wild beast there also. The wild beast here is speaking about the demonic powers that are there as well, uh, facing the Lord Jesus. He was throwing everything at him that he had. Satan that was such an onslaught, such an attack on the Lord Jesus. And as we look at these temptations in the coming weeks, we'll see the severity and the strategic direction in which Satan uh, attacked the Savior. But very quickly in finishing, here we see the powers defeating the temptations. The powers that defeated the temptations, Jesus himself was there. Praise God. The Lord Jesus himself was there. He's been through it. He knows what it is. And this is where we draw our encouragement this morning. This is where we draw our strength this morning. The Lord Jesus, he's our forerunner. He's our great high priest. He's the great sympathizer. He was there. He knows all about our condition. And he'll be with us. That's the present power. The present power of Christ was there in the wilderness. 
And the Lord says that he will never leave us, he'll never forsake us. But the other interesting point was that the first thing Jesus did when he went into this wilderness was he fasted and he prayed. He fasted and he prayed. And this is a tremendous exercise that you can do as a believer is to fast and pray, which is the chastening of the soul, the chastening of the body, and it will bring tremendous answers to prayer. You'll read uh, an example of that in Daniel chapter 10, verse 12, where he chastened himself, he fasted, and he prayed, and God came in a mighty way, and God will come to us. And also the blessed Holy Spirit was there because the Lord Jesus was filled with the Holy Ghost. He had the indwelling power of God with him. He was filled. He was impelled. He was empowered uh, by the Spirit. He had the glorious anointing of the Holy Ghost with him in the trials. Friends, that's wonderful to know that the Lord is with us in our trials, supplying strength, supplying power. Here's the indwelling power of God within every believer. The indwelling power of God, God was there. He was there as well. The Father's heart was there. In Hebrews 13 and 5, he says, I will never leave thee. I will never forsake thee. Omnipotent power, this omnific power to create the Father God Almighty, he's there. And if that's not enough, then he sent his glorious ministering angels. They were there. Doesn't it say that in Psalm 91 and 11? For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. He's there. He's with us. And the blessing is uh, that this temptation period, it's only for a season. The believer doesn't live his life there. Jesus didn't live his life in the wilderness. It was a season and period of time. And bless God, as we go through this, we'll see that he come out in the power of the Spirit. And so will we. Amen. May God bless his word to all our hearts this morning for his name's sake.